So uh, the next speaker is Jonathan Kay, and the topic is uh, becoming R Rega or Raja. I'm not a professional, so we'll hear it from a professional. Uh, North Indian Raja music has a technology of integral becoming presentation and music performance. That's very impressive one as. Uh, uh, Jonathan Kerr is an internationally recognized improvising jazz musician uh, who's very uh, widespread in interests and uh, techniques that and uh, the efforts uh, he puts into using the techniques for expressing certain lively ideas um, beyond the performance itself. So the main topic of the presentation before the actual uh, music musical session is dedicated to the way we can mm, free our thoughts through not a direct, not indirect action. Uh, that is music, especially the type of music that's going to be presented further. So um, I'm giving the, the word to Jonathan. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. Great, great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it's been a super inspiring uh, couple days for me. It's been early, um, some early mornings, or yesterday was early for me. I'm here in Toronto, but uh, I really um, I really appreciate all the amazing inspiration coming from uh, the talks, the presentations, the discussions. So I think I'm going to do something uh, um, a little different, bring in some, some music to the circle. Um, I'll just start by, uh, I guess, introducing a little bit more specifically about what I'll be speaking about today and playing about today. Um, so I'm from Toronto. Um, my brother, um, Andrew will be joining me for the music portion today as well. You'll see him. Uh, and I'm a, currently a PhD student at the California Institute of Integral Studies, which is a really interesting um, cross-cultural. It started as a cross-cultural institute back in the, the, the late 50s, actually. Um, and this talk will be taking an autoethnographic perspective. Um, which is the methodology I'm using in my dissertation. Uh, it's an arts-based methodology that, that I find is really suitable to try to find um, a place in which music and, and thought and, and life, culture, they can all kind of intersect and, and, and ideas can come from that intersection. Um, and so I'll be sort of loosely following um, that kind of a perspective um, throughout this talk. I'm a trained uh, jazz musician. And as the same with my brother, actually, we have the same background. We went to Humber College here in Toronto. Um, and certain questions of cross-culturality came into our ideas about music and jazz. Jazz is being, has always been quite a porous uh, art form, I've found. It's always been looking to integrate and, and to fold from the outside um, elements. And so in the music of John Coltrane, who's a great inspiration of mine, he, at one point in his career, uh, looked to India, actually, for uh, philosophical, spiritual wisdom and, and, and musical ideas. Um, and I found that was fascinating. And the more research I did, the more I realized in the jazz tradition itself, there's always, there's always been that looking to the outside. Um, and so uh, uh, my brother and I went to India, actually. And I ended up living in India for 10 years in Calcutta. I have two uh, different musical gurus, um, Shantanu Bhattacharya, who's a singer, and um, Abir Singh Kangura, who uh, is uh, the guru of the instrument I'm going to play first here. And so my, my musical life, which is what I'm sort of going to be using as the material for this talk for the ideas that come up in this talk um, and in my dissertation as well it's it's it will be looking at my musical life and how music has sort of been a field of of you know let's say of identity making as a feel as a problematic field that I was was sort of confronted um, with certain problems and questions existential questions problems and questions of becoming 
and I'll get into that a little bit more later. But I think most importantly, I try, I'm trying to find that that horizon, that almost impossible horizon between music and thought or sound and thinking. Um, and so the talk will take you from, from Gil Deleuze when he's asking what, what can art do rather than what does it mean or, but like what can music do? Um, and then also in recent studies, I've been really into um, the methodology of Francois Laurel. So this paper, is, is attempting to think with music, think through music, not think about music. And so I'll talk a little bit about the musical, musicological and ethnomusicological ramifications of that. Um, so the mystical questions that have arisen um, in my life started when I was a jazz musician. And I had certain experiences playing music at a certain point late in college after I'd, I'd practiced for you know a decade of, of technique on my instrument and learned the language of jazz. I was playing with friends and I was getting to a place where things were happening more and more fluidly. And I had certain experiences like a lot of musicians that, that I grew up around did have to some degree that sort of took you out of space and time. It took you, it, 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 there was sort of a, a non-dual space in which you became sound, you became music, you became the flow, um, the flow of, of sound in that way. And it sort of, it forced me, it created a rupture that forced me to really confront what's going on here and how, how is this, how is this possible? What's happening? And how can I do that again? <laughs> what, like, what's the meaning of that anyway? And it was like, well, how does that happen, right? And so going to India, I found that there was a, it's a very, obviously, we all know that how rich a place like India is in terms of its, its spirituality, its philosophy, and music is so embedded in, the, in, the, in all of that. Um, and so I'll be using some ideas from the sonic theology or the sonic, you know, sonic spirituality that um, from the ways in which I learned raga music. So uh, the, raga, the talk here is called Becoming Raga. And I've, I decided to not start with a, a pure North Indian raga. I do play that music. Uh, I've gone and done that discipline. I mean, I have that discipline. That sort of, you could say, my spiritual sadhana. I, I play ragas most days. But today I wanted to sort of be a little more experimental. And... Uh, so with my brother, I'm going to play what I call, for the lack of a better term, I'm not really sure um, if I've, I'm not settled on this, this word, but it's, I call it a raga creation, um, a raga invention, maybe. It's not a traditional raga. Um, it's going to be, you could say, um, uh, you know, in a way, for, to use, my paper doesn't do this, but in a way I'm developing ideas um, using Laurel's language, which is sort of like, cloning the ragas and then superimposing them. So this raga is, is going to include three um, raga, um, raga personalities, you could say, um, from the tradition, but the way in which they're superimposed on each other, there, there's new, new possibilities that arise from that, from that collision. Um, and so this first piece um, does not necessarily even have a title yet, but it's an experiment along those lines. And I wanted to share that um, it's, it's coming very deeply from you know, the praxis of North Indian music, the aesthetics, um, the instrument, the instrumentation here of, of my instrument anyway. And um, we'll see, we'll start with that. And then I'm going to get into some of the, the ideas like sort of that have come up in my life through this kind of uh, transcultural horizons in which I find myself. Um, uh, in, in, you know, in relation, uh, finding the relationality of different musical traditions. So at this point, I think we'll just get, I'll get tuned up quickly. Quick, um, quick a little bit about this instrument. This is called Esraj. It's a, a larger version of a, of a more popular uh, semi-classical and folk uh, instrument uh, from the Bengal, from um, this, the state that Calcutta is in, West Bengal. 
And um, there's not many people that play this in the world. I moved to a town called Shantanikitan, which is where Rabindranath Tagore started, um, what now is a very famous university. And, um, and I learned with Abir Singh Kangura there. And so this instrument was made a little bit bigger from this, the, the more regular version of the Esaraj to suit classical Indian music, uh, like the pure classical music. And my brother, Andrew, um, he's gonna be playing on this first piece, uh, a hand selected set of Himalayan singing bowls um, that, that are tuned according to the, the music we're playing. So enjoy, we'll see what happens. Turn it up. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to get set up for some music audio here. There's a, a, a digital instrument that is playing from a small speaker. It's called the Tanpura. And it's, uh, if we had a third musician, then they would be playing it acoustically. But a lot of people rely on these digital um, tanpuras. It's a four string instrument that creates the, the drone, the canvas in which the music set.
Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see a little closer here. Lapel is on. Oh. Great. Okay, so to get into some of the thoughts that correspond to this way of being musical, um, one of the main questions that this um, that this work is about is that how how can one musically build an interface between the inside and the outside, the finite, the infinite, the human, the non-human, the imminent or transcendent planes? That to me was uh, some kind of a intuitive kernel of what these kind of ex musical experiences um, were leading me towards. And so theoretically, I found that at, um, with my mentor at CIIS, uh, Debashish Banerjee, he pointed me in, the right, in, in a good direction to find thinkers and ways of thinking and lang uh, languages that can inspire and also gave, tried to uh, help me learn how to create language to describe certain kinds of musicalities. Um, so I learned Indian raga music um, from uh, Shantanu Bhattacharya mainly, um, and he is a disciple of Sri Aurobindo. And at first, going to Kolkata as a, a foreigner, you know, I was there for music lessons I wanted to learn about Indian music but I very quickly realized that it was really not as much about the specifics of music but the whole cultural container and in my experience I really embrace the fact that you can't separate these things out you can try and you can get something if you just say went to India as a as a Torontonian you, you can get musical elements but for me it was a question of the, the music as being the the language or the, the entry point into you know the infinity that is that culture and so i lived in india and immersed myself um, uh, some of my work i've tried to think along the lines of that process of becoming an insider to some degree of um, uh, like what is an imminent hermeneutic that allo allowed allowed me to sort of try to feel some of the soil that this music is coming from um, and so in terms of being, um, in terms of learning this music, uh, it was a natural expression of my guru's sense of what integral yoga was. Um, so this paper will talk, use Sri Aurobindo a little bit, um, his questions of the integral. Um, and I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the post-structuralism of Gil Deleuze and uh, Gilbert Simondon. And all of these thinkers are thinkers of ontogenesis and individuation. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, um, individuation can be seen as an, an existential problematic. So as I started to read a little bit uh, of Sri Aurobindo uh, in, in, alongside learning from my music from my guru, I realized that there was, there was a resonance here. There was something that was very clearly coming from integral questions of becoming that work that was very um, contained in the way I learned the music. Um, and as a cross-cultural subject, I found that, that, that Sri Aurobindo, who is also a cross-cultural subject, um, I won't take too much time to speak about his history, but he was raised the Bengali. He was raised in, in, in England um, and he was educated in England. And before coming back to his own culture, before having to learn his own mother tongue um, from scratch when he was a lot older and he became a freedom fighter so his his you can say and my mentor Debashish Banerjee talks about how questions of yoga came to Sri Aurobindo Aurobindo Ghos at that time as a freedom fighter it was a questions that concerned um, how do you know what to do which is the you could say the central theme of dharma in the Bhagavad Gita and um he, you know, being a, uh, a time, being of modernity, Sri Aurobindo could be said to be a, a modern yogi in that sense, because his, his yoga is, is tackling questions unique to modernity. Um, and so one of the big questions is the integral. So I'm going to read just a short quote here to uh, illustrate what I'm speaking about from, uh, from uh, my mentor here, Banerjee, Debashish Banerjee. Um, this is speaking about um, integral yoga. 
Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga was designed to develop an integral consciousness he called supermind. This can be seen as a consciousness um, paradoxical to the rational intellect in which traditional Indian realizations of imminence and transcendence are fully experienced at the same time. All right, sorry, that was mine. This is Debashishu's here um, from his uh, journal on integral yoga psychology. Sri Aurobindo conceived of integral consciousness as a supramental ontology representing an aporetic perspectival vanishing point in mental experience and a possibility for future evolution. Thus, an integral consciousness is seen by him as a difference, not in decree, but in kind from mental consciousness, one to which absolute unity and radical infinite infinity are identical. And so the supramental or the integral consciousness here can be likened to Deleuze's, Gil Deleuze's plane of imminence, where pluralism equals monism. Um, and so the, the question that would that I felt relates to this conference is what what is that kind of conscious state and what would a mysticism be like in that state um, is it mystical and what would it what would it be like um, so I spoke a little bit about how I'm approaching music as an ex existential field of becoming a, a, a territory in which you can assemble um, elements of music or musical cultures, ways of being musical, and you can create structures of musical becoming. So for instance, um, what, what we did today was we took structures of, of raga music, but we opened them up. We sort of, um, we, we took out, as Laurel would say, the sufficiency of that tradition or that traditional um, that authority. And we opened it up and made it more porous and we added some some, some more jazz types of, or more of a jazz uh, consciousness in terms of jazz as a way of, of playing with elements within the field. So uh, another important concept in terms of the idea of transculturality and how it is that I'm trying to feel and trying to be musical in uh, a, a plural space. Um, I, I called the music transcultural heterocultural is another interesting term he, um, heteromusical heteromusicality is something else that may be a way of approaching the kind of space that i feel like um, i'm kind of trying to explore and maybe the next piece that we play to end uh, will be uh, more of an expression of that but um, simon don has a, uh, the, uses the idea of transduction which is basically a site of individuation that um, you know, the, uh, it's a, in which heterogeneous elements form individuating series. And so rather than being dialectical, um, in, it's non-dialectical, it's non-representational, it's, it's a place in which, again, to use Laurel's quite suitable language, I think, things can collide. Possibilities can happen that are, are not, um, that haven't been pre-programmed into, into it or... or um... Okay. Um... Something else that I would like to bring out and differentiate in terms of how I learned raga music, I learned it as a spiritual practice, as a sadhana. Um, and in the tradition of raga music, there is there is a long lineage, a long history of the connoisseurs, these these sort of elite um, types of people that will will be a, a connoisseur of a raga. Um, and because the raga music is history, is in court culture. Um, that that does it, it, that's part of the history of it, and I just wanted to bring out that I didn't learn raga music that way. I was in an environment in which yes, there was a lot of let's say people that were approaching the music more from a, a place of of connoisseuring ragas, but I learned it as 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 a, a, a site of transformation basically, um, and so you could say that uh, a connoisseur would be a consumer of raga flavors. So there's many different ragas you would come and you could sort of, you would consume these flavors as you, you know, like the word rasa in India, it's a, the taste, it's a, it's a suitable analogy here in the sense that you can, you can consume the flavors of ragas and you can col collect these kind of cultural experiences. Um, and to that, that would be a form of, of cultural um, currency, really. Um, and if you don't enter into the raga music with that intention of 
being transformed, then it's, a, it's somewhat of a different uh, ball game. It's a different, uh, different possibilities, I guess, will be present. So I'd like to approach the idea of, of this musical field, specifically in raga music, um, as, and I will call that raga space. It's a, it's, a, it's a space or a territory in which, again, a heterogeneous site in which different um, elements can come and interact. So musical elements, which in which is this, that's sort of the study of traditional musicology and ethnomusicology too, um, would include the notes, the timing, the rhythm, the lyrics, if, if there's a lyric to the piece, um, of the composition, the specific instruments. But there's, a, there's so many intra and supra and transpersonal or musical elements that are involved in the music. And raga music actually brings light to some of those um, very consciously, like the, the mood of the, the raga. Ragas are, are traditionally endowed with some type of a, a mood. Now that's, that can be problematized and questioned too, but, but the, the mood of the performer. Um, some musicians like Ali Akbar Khan has said, well, the, the moods are in, um, all, all their moods are present in each raga. It's a matter of what you really want to bring out of that raga. So the mood of the individual. Um, but there's so many other things that are present, like the, the, the training, the amount of like the thousands or tens of thousands of hours you sit with your guru um, in training. Um, there's also something in India called the, the Garana, which is a geocultural style and uh, stylization of the raga. The ragas remain very similar, but the, the style ornaments and such are different. Um, the time of day, the weather, the acoustics of the hall, um, and so forth, ad infinite, infinitum really. Um, and so the raga space is trying to bring awareness and, and bring and uh, the space of possibility to a lot of these other things to um, influence, affect us. And um, it's also notable that um, ragas are performed specifically to a time of day. And so the raga, you will learn the raga not only as music, um, this is just an example, but you will learn it as a specific time of day. The, like, let's say the uh, psycho psycho-spiritual state that comes at that time of day, let's say waking up in the morning, you like, you can associate, everybody would be, have a different habit, but you can associate that with the opening of consciousness, the welcoming of the day and so forth. Um, and that, that right there is just an example of how into the tradition, the way I learned raga music, there's, there's a lot of possibilities um, in terms of thinking about other types of singularities that are going to be happening in this field. And that, you know, you could say, you know, Deleuze speaks of the hey, hey, um, hey, see a of, of like where he's interested in thinking about a time of day as for that's one of his examples. So this is some nice resonances here. Um, so from this perspective, Raga space activates a site of transduction in which heterogeneous gradients of becoming enter into individuating series. The Raga bhav or mood is developed slowly by the performer and provides an aesthetic gravity in which to organize and integrate elements into these singularities. This may develop into levels of sonic intensity, which result in an aesthetic rupture, um, which is called the rasa um, or the sublime taste coming from Abhigavagupta's theories uh, in the performer audience and in the environment. This rupture may be of various natures and can be considered an encounter with the outside in which one enters into union with, with a raga deity, for instance. And so I'm going to extend this raga space now to say, well, how is this raga space uh, a, a ritual, a ritual space as well? Um, which again, it was built, it was really part of my training in this music. It's not, a, it's not um, the, the tradition, North Indian classical music is plural, and there's a lot of different approaches to this. I'm speaking about mine specifically. Um, so a Hindu ritual or puja can be considered an architectonic organization of spatial and temporal sacred materials, which create an interface or sieve, divas pade, um, from Sri Aurobindo's uh, translation of that word divas pade, between individual and cosmic being or beings. This interface can open one to relationship with animistic forces of nature, archetypal gods, or the universal self, Purusha. 
Jurabindo develops these ideas in his psychocosmological interpretation of the Vedas. Uh, quote, the cosmic powers act and exist. Humankind takes them upon himself, makes an image of them in his own consciousness and endows that image with the life and power that the supreme being has breathed into his own divine forms and world energies. And I'll compare that here to um, another sort of post or Deleuzian scholar, contemporary scholar, O'Sullivan. And he's going to talk about the puja or the ritual space from a, in, through a Deleuzian lens as a time machine to the outside of the human register. So here's O'Sullivan on the puja. Quote, the puja is not representational, but something altogether different, a summoning of other beings, a space, and a practice of incarnation in which the invisible, that which lies outside the human register, outside the fantasies of realism, outside mundane time, is made visible. The puja operates as a portal into or onto these other worlds, precisely as a kind of space-time machine. So some of the themes are coming out in, in these thinkers that I had mentioned earlier on. Um, and have helped me understand a little bit more and given given help give some language to some of these types of experiences um so right going right back to that idea of being out, outside a, time, a space time machine sometimes leading outside of time sometimes leading to different experiences of time or duration in the bergsonian sense um i was going to skip this, this next part because i feel like it's getting a little long but i wanted to mention it because yesterday there was men mention of theurgy and in the initial um in my initial research that was also part of extending this this kind of uh this this type of thought um and there's an interesting quote about how we can see uh theurgy through a sonic practice practice like raga music the theurgy is understood as a magical ritual to invoke deities to achieve henosis, uniting with the divine and perfecting oneself. This definition can illustrate how ragas, as they are understood as sonic deities, can, through a Hindu mystical um, ritual, can be considered an act of theurgy. This is a, a quote now from a, a, an Indian musicologist from the turn of the last century. Quote, the application to the theory of Indian music, this doctrine of image worship, i.e. the idea of invoking the presiding deity or the spirit of the divinity by means of a dhyana formula, an, an evocative scheme of prayers for contemplation, has led to the conception of the forms of ragas and raginis um, is in dual aspects as audible sound forms and as visible image forms. And so the question that I'm going to now address comes from these two ideas of sound forms and image forms. How can we understand the structural and architectonic integrity of a raga without reducing it to a structural analysis, thereby eliminating the unique singularities of the present in which the artist spontaneously interprets the raga? Um, and I'll, I'll be using a Deleuzian framework here to talk about ragas, which is from his book, Spinoza, Practical Philosophy. Um, and this leads me to using from that book, two interconnected planes or plans of structure and genesis. Um, and this is where I see the questions of, this is where I guess the, the, the poetics of becoming raga is starting to come out for me in terms of how I experience this music in language though. Um, and so how do we understand a raga? I guess this is a question, um, and not to go into the history of that, but traditionally, uh, and through ethnomusicology and musicology, it was understood as a scale, a mode, a melodic ascent and descent. And those were some, as I studied the, the, I guess the musicological roots of raga music, I was, I was very underwhelmed by what I was reading compared to what I was experiencing. And so Therefore, I felt the need to to try to, like I said, find languages to to get a little bit more into what I really felt was the raga is to me. So I'm going to say my definition here is a raga is a melodic being in becoming, composed of a collection of intricate melodic phrases, 
um, which I will call the, the phraseology, informed by an architectonic structure. And so this, now we can relate to the different images from um, Ganguly that uh, the musicologist I just read the quote from, um, which is a sound image and the form image. So now this will be a, a bunch of information, but on one side, from the Deleuzian perspective, we have the plane of transcendence or organization, he calls it. And that to me would be the being of the Raga. I've learned the Raga as a being, as a consciousness. Um, and so the praxis of this is contemplation on the phraseology. So the phraseology would be the collection of phrases. A raga is made up of, I'd say, between five and ten very, very specific phrases that you could say is the, is the kernel, is the seed potential. And each time you start playing that raga, that potential is, is held latent in, in the idea of the raga, um, the form image in a way, right? And so it will it, it will. Be, pass into duration, it'll come into time through a governing architectonic. But right now it's the, the phraseology is that seed or bija in, in Indian ideas. Um, we could call this an eternal image, um, something that is in sp is space, but not time. Um, and in terms of the yoga of Sri Aurobindo, the integral yoga is composed, uh, is, it's thought of a, a lot of different ways, but specifically, um, uh, in the ways I'm using it in his early iterations, it would be the yoga of the purusha or the soul. So this plane of transcendence is the being of the raga, the phraseology, the image form or the form image. Um, and you can liken it to the yoga of the soul or purusha in which one becomes the transcendental witness consciousness separate from the automatons of nature. So the second Deleuzian plane is going to be the plane of imminence or plane of composition. And this is the becoming of the raga in time. And this is where we have the understanding of the architectonic, um, the interrelationship of all of that, of those phrases and the, this, this uh, seed potential as it, as, as it evolves in time. Um, and this would be like the, re, the generation of the eternal image in, in time. So to liken it to the second aspect of the integral yoga, the yoga of prakriti or nature, in which from the freedom of the poise of the witnessing purusha, one sanctions and enters into prakriti or nature um, as the Ishwara or Lord of nature. Um, and these two planes can also be likened to, in Sri yoga, but also back into to, it's his reading of the, of the Upanishads. The plane of transcendence can be known, is known as jnana, and the plane of imminence can be known as vigyana. And vig, and the integral yoga in one iteration can be seen as the, the, the weaving or the in, in, in integration of both of these yogas. Some yogas will do, will privilege one over the other. A lot of traditional yogas will privilege the, the plane of transcendence. You, you get into relation with that and then you sort of get out. Um, so in terms of getting to the end of this talk and we'll have, we'll, this time we'll play, I'd like to play another piece too, but the question of the integral becoming integral now is is from my experience in raga music i feel that i can i have a, um, glimpsed how these two plane uh, these two uh planes of imminence transcendence may interact musically and so that is something that in me in my practice of integral yoga has allowed, has sort of given me um, a praxis or something not within thought, but within a, another way of knowing, a sonic way of knowing, the being of sensation, how that can understand what Sri may be getting to as in terms of talking about an integral consciousness. Um, and so the, the simultaneous knowledge of both of these um, is really what he would call as as being a paradoxical to the to the rational intellect which is just one part of the being in indian philosophy anyway but in the integral realization there would be a, a simultaneous realization of both jnana and vigyana and so i think that's where trying to illustrate this musically 
trying to play musically um, some of these ideas that was that's my my hope was that that you can you can feel some of how what i'm saying is is really coming from the musical way of being the musical way of knowing um and that's about it um that's i guess that's i'll, I'll end there well, this is um this is a piece by Ornette Coleman called Lonely Woman, set to a drone. Um, so again, uh, maybe maybe we'll, we'll embark or we'll encounter a heterocultural sound space here. We'll see. Ready.
Great, thank you. Very beautiful, thank you.